You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week, we meet historian Cassandra Good. She spent a decade researching George Washington's immediate family, a story she tells in a new book titled First Family. George Washington had no biological children, but he and Martha raised two of her four grandchildren after Martha's son Jackie died. Young Wash Custis and his sister Nellie accompanied the new president to the early capital cities of New York and Philadelphia, where they quickly became celebrities. Cassandra Good's larger story is how the four Custis children spent the rest of their lives capitalizing on their Washington connections, an early example of America's celebrity culture. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Cassandra Good, you have a new book out called First Family, Washington's Heirs and the Making of America. I wanted to start our conversation with the photo, or it's really a painting, that appears on the cover of your book, something that you say was hanging on the wall of thousands of early Americans' homes. Washington, we know, was childless. So who are the young people in this painting? So there's two children in the painting. The young woman is named Nellie or Eleanor Park Custis. And the boy is George Washington Park Custis. Uh, his nickname, just because that's a mouthful, I will refer to him as Wash. And these were Martha's grandchildren by her first marriage. So George Washington's step-grandchildren. How they uh, were raised by the Washingtons. How did they come to live with them? Yeah, they were sort of de facto adopted. There wasn't a official legal way to adopt them at this point, but they were referred to as George Washington's adopted children. Basically what happened was their father, John Park Custis or Jackie, had married fairly young and he and his wife, Eleanor Calvert Custis, had uh, seven children actually very quickly, four of whom survived. Then Jackie decided to go down to Yorktown in 1781 during the revolution to contribute to the cause. He gets camp fever and dies, leaving his young widow with four children, five and under. And so the Washingtons, partially because Martha loves children and partially to help the widowed uh, mother of four take in the two younger children at the point that they're you know, toddlers, infants, and end up raising them for the rest of their lives. What happened to the other two children? What was their fate? Right, so Elizabeth and Martha, or Eliza and Patty, stay with their mother. They do spend a lot of time at Mount Vernon. Sometimes they're coming over there for things like music lessons, dance lessons. They spend some time in the president's house during the presidency. So they're also known as part of the family at this point, but they're living with their mother who very soon remarries a man named David Stewart. And then their mother and stepfather have a bunch more children. So they are living in a house full of half siblings and they're living in relative rural isolation. So things are a little bit more difficult for them in certain ways. And their mother worries they don't have the same kind of advantages that Nellie and Wash are getting because of living with George and Martha. And then living in New York and Philadelphia when those are the capital cities and all the educational advantages that they have. So lots of little interesting factoids that are in this story that you tell. One of those, Jackie Custis's estate, Abington, is the site of today's Washington Reagan National Airport, uh, which, yeah. which is kind of hard to imagine. If you visited the airport today, would you see any signs of it? Yes, you have to sort of go outside of the airport and around one of the parking lots. And there is a historic marker for the foundations of the house. And that was the house that they lived in in the 18th century. They don't live there that long. Um, 
But yes, that was a working plantation. And then they also had land just north of that that becomes uh, what we know today as Arlington Cemetery. Another piece of information in here is that uh, the fact that George Washington was childless was a key factor in his election as president. How did that work? I think people at the time were obviously rejecting monarchy as part of the revolution. Part of what they had decided is it doesn't make sense. This was Thomas Paine's argument in Common Sense. It does not make sense to have a monarchy. You should have people in power who are qualified and didn't just inherit that position. And so there was some worry. How are we going to keep up this system of a presidency? This is something new. And if the president had children, biological children especially, there's a big focus at this point on biological children. The fact that he has adopted children, people see a difference. And so the the idea here is, well, this is a benefit that there are no biological children that could try and take over his place in power. The other worry here, which people like John Adams talk about, is that if Washington had had biological children, the normal practice in monarchies is for the children of monarchs to marry other monarchs' children to create diplomatic alliances. And that could have happened, or at least Europeans may have wanted to make that happen if George Washington had had biological children. And so it sort of comforts people in this new experiment in a democratic republic that the first president does not have a biological child who could take over from him. As a historian, how did the story of Washington's extended family interest you enough to spend 10 years researching it? Yeah, it certainly has been a long research process. I actually came across the people in this book while I was working on my first book and really even my dissertation in graduate school at University of Pennsylvania. And I was writing about friendships between men and women. And I came across... Eliza and Nellie Custis, as well as George Washington's nephew, Bushrod. And I had not heard of these people before. I knew that George Washington didn't have any biological children. And then to find that, in fact, he had this nephew who inherits Mount Vernon, and then he had grandchildren or step-grandchildren that he helped to raise and that were the next generation of his family I was really fascinated by that, especially since, you know, we talk about the importance that Washington is a president and not a king, but in many ways he was treated like a king, like a king. They celebrated his birthday. Um, You know, there's still some sort of trappings of royalty there. So what is it going to be like for the next generation? And I assumed that there was a biography of them. I looked and there wasn't. There are books that cover various parts of Washington's family, but there was nothing comprehensive. So I started out this project just thinking, okay, I'm writing about Washington's descendants, obviously not direct biological descendants, and who are those people exactly? People would say, well, so who are you writing about? And at first I wasn't sure. And it became clear that while there were plenty of nieces and nephews, people like Bushrod Washington, who inherits Mount Vernon, those people didn't go around sort of selling themselves as George Washington's heirs and the next generation of the family. It was the Custises, who were blood related to Martha, but not George. It was these four children who basically made careers out of being George Washington's family. And certainly that portrait that we started out with helps because at least the younger two children are in lots of people's homes in a print of that portrait already. They are really famous. They are celebrities from the presidency. People know who they are. Whereas the nieces and nephews don't really have that. And I just found the Custis's continual striving to be the keepers of George Washington's legacy. You know, at times it's almost funny what they're doing or ridiculous, but it really intrigued me and kept me digging for papers, for sources, for all of those years to write this book. Did you see any parallels between the Custis grandchildren and today's social media influencers? It's interesting because I often talk about the Custises as being a little bit like the Kardashians in the sense that they're famous for being famous. They are not famous because they have any particular talents. Um, I'm not trying to say that 
no influencers or people like the Kardashians have any talents, but at a certain point, the celebrity just sort of carries on on its own and because of the family name. And so they are sort of using, they also know that they can use the media in, in different ways than now, but if they give a speech or if they give a gift, to somebody that is of a Washington relic, they'll send that information to the newspaper and they know that the newspapers will report on it and get themselves in the news. So they are crafting their identity as Washington's family and keeping themselves as celebrities the rest of their lives. What was the state of the newspaper industry in this period of our history? There are a lot of small local newspapers And in fact, by the mid 19th century, there were a lot more newspapers then than there are today. In most cities, each political party, the two political part and main political parties had their own newspapers. And then there might be additional papers. Really after the 1830s, when printing becomes more accessible and cheap, you get an explosion of newspapers. But often what they're doing is just reprinting stories from other papers. So it's not that you're getting original reporting on the Custises all over the country. You're getting the same story repeated over and over again, sometimes over the course of months or even years in multiple newspapers that get passed around sometimes in small communities, read, you know, in pubs or coffee houses. And people are very attuned to reading the news and following these newspapers. The early chapters of the book, we see a lot of George and Martha themselves. And I found it interesting because to us today, they are paintings or marble sculptures. And you actually show them as grandparents. What kind of grandparents were they? It's interesting. I think they, that George and Martha were very different as grandparents because George, when the kids are younger, is more hands off and leaving things to Martha, partially because he's you know, when they first adopt them, still finishing up the American Revolution, and then later during the presidency. So it's partially a time thing, partially the tradition of women raising the younger children, and then the men getting involved, especially with the sons when it comes to their education. And when George starts getting involved with Wash's education, we see him getting frustrated. We see him as a disciplinarian. He went through the same thing with Wash's father, Jackie. Neither of them were good students. And Wash is you know, as bad or worse of a student than his father, he drops out of multiple schools. And George is trying over and over again to persuade him to pay more attention to his studies, to work harder, to stay in school. And so you see that side of George trying to be a disciplinarian and getting really frustrated. And you also see a much softer side with the girls, especially as they get older, and he's giving them courtship advice. And he tailors his courtship advice to each of the granddaughters. And when Nellie says to him, oh, I think I'm just going to be a spinster for life. He writes her this long letter saying, you can't control if you're going to fall in love and that can happen. So here's what you need to think about. So we can see definitely sort of the harder disciplinarian side of him as a grandfather or father figure. And then the much softer side that I think we usually don't think about with George Washington. Now, and then when comes- Martha as a grandmother, you uh, say she was beyond doting uh, and so much so that people were concerned about her level of involvement in their lives. Right. Martha, I think, is very driven by the fact that she has had so much loss in her life. She loses two of her four children with her first husband. And then those two children that survive, one of them only close to adulthood, her daughter dies at 17. Uh, She loses her first husband, then she loses her son, Jackie. So she is obsessively worried about the health of the children and wants to pamper them, basically. And other members of the family are concerned. They're saying she is way too indulgent. She's not setting any boundaries. They're going to become insufferable, basically. The tutor for the kids, Tobias Lear, is particularly concerned about this. And he's especially concerned about Wash Custis. And part of what he sees is that having enslaved people waiting on Wash Custis, that as a young boy, he is already a master of enslaved people, that is going to his head and making him unpleasant. And there's this worry, what do we do about this? And at least according to the tutor, George Washington was pained to see that the kids weren't being disciplined enough, but didn't want to interfere with Martha because it would upset her. So that's a sort of different picture of Martha as a grandmother than I think we would assume. 
Did you get any sense with all of the time you spent with their papers and uh, other people describing them whether in fact this did play out with them as adults and, and whether or not they were difficult personalities? Well, I think you could describe all four of the Costas grandchildren as difficult personalities in their own ways. These are children that grew up with so much privilege. And we have to, it's hard to know how much of this is Martha's fault for not setting boundaries. First of all, it was sort of a trope of the time that grandmothers were too indulgent. So we don't know how much of it is that. There's also the fact that the children of the founding generation often ended up like this, not successful. They had such heavy expectations placed on them they were supposed to be independent and self-guided, but they were also supposed to do what their parents wanted. They were in a really tough spot. They could never live up to the expectations of that founding generation. So we see people like Dolly Madison's son, um, his name was actually Payne. And you know he is a gambler who racks up huge debts and his stepfather, James Madison, doesn't know what to do with him. So part of what's happening with the Custises is not that unusual. And it's not clear how much of that is because of Martha. On the other hand, she does have a son and a grandson, two boys in a row that just are unable to finish school, really don't commit themselves to public service in the way that George Washington certainly would have wanted. They don't come close to meeting, I think, George Washington's standards for them. How much of that is George Washington's fault? Uh, It's hard to know. So in 1787, when George Washington was elected president, what was the family reaction? When George finds out that he's going to be president, and they kind of knew this for a while. So from the beginning of the Constitutional Convention, as they're creating the role of presidency, George Washington is in mind. When they get the official word, the family's upset. Martha doesn't want to have to leave Mount Vernon. George doesn't want to have to leave. He was glad to be able to be back home after being gone so much during the American Revolution, but he feels like he has to serve. And the younger kids are going to go with them, which is especially hard for their mother and two elder sisters, because part of their mother's understanding when she sent two of her younger kids to live in Mount Vernon is that she'd be close enough to them. Abingdon National Airport is not that far from Mount Vernon. So she could have seen them quite often. If they're going up to the capitals initially in New York and then Philadelphia, she's not going to see them. The two older girls are not going to see their siblings. So it's really painful for the family to have to say goodbye to one another. And I should also note there's another group of people that gets drawn into this, which is the enslaved people at Mount Vernon that the Washingtons bring with them to New York and then to Philadelphia that are separated from their families, too, and really don't have any choice. We have had no experience with this as a nation when George, Martha, and the children went to the first capital in New York City. Uh, How old were the two children at that point? So Nellie is 10 years old and Wash is eight. So, you know, they're kids. They're aware enough to know what's going on. They're They see all the fanfare greeting them on their trip up to New York. There's a parade in the city when they get there. They are on display from day one. And that's interesting because, and picking up on your comments earlier about the concern about a royalty, the public reaction to the Washingtons, you write, the public didn't want royalty, but they seemed to crave a family that would serve as a model and a symbol for the nation. Well, first, your comments on that. And then what kind of learning adjustment, public pressure was, was put on Martha and the children as a result of this? It's an interesting question because look now at how fascinated Americans are by royalty. And it's not that we today seem to want our president's families to be royalty, but we also devote a lot of media coverage to them. Um, I remember, you know, you can remember back to the way the Obamas tried to shield their daughters, the way the Clintons tried to sort of shield Chelsea Clinton from the media. So there is a long tradition going back to the Washingtons of intense focus on the family But the only model that the public had at the point that George Washington becomes president is royalty. They were used to following George III and his many, many children. And so this is sort of their new substitute. And there's even debates over the title for the president. There were people that were suggesting instead of Mr. President that he be called his elective highness, 
And he, at receptions, he and Martha are sitting on a raised dais in the room. So there's still these trappings of monarchy that they haven't quite gotten past in the country. And even if this family is not going to be a royal family, they are going to be the subject of attention all the time. And it is expected that not just George is attending ceremonial events, but that Martha will be with him and that often the children will be with him. And then as Nellie gets older and is a talented musician, she is called upon quite regularly to play the harpsichord for visiting dignitaries, you know, members of Congress that are coming to dinner, whoever is coming to the president's house. So this family in many ways, you know, it's similar to the first family today with the exception that at least now the White House has a separate private quarters. The president's house at this point had no separation. George Washington's office in Philadelphia was on the third floor. You had to go upstairs past the kids' bedrooms to get to a cabinet meeting. So you can see they're really, they don't have a lot of privacy. When did uh, the term first family come into use? Interestingly, that's not used at the time that the Washingtons are in office. We first start seeing it occasionally used in the late 19th century, but it appears that it doesn't become popularly used until the Kennedys, actually, in you know, the mid 20th century. So it is a fairly recent term. What did they refer to in the press uh, of Martha Washington? So they would say the president's lady, something like that. And we actually saw with You know, the next first lady, Abigail Adams, was sometimes referred to as Lady Presidentess. She was seen as having a lot more power in the administration than Martha was in theirs. So, yes, it would be Mrs. Washington, the president's lady, and they'd refer to the children as uh, the president's, you know, if it's Wash, the president's adopted son or Mrs. Washington's grandchildren. So people knew how they were related. George Washington's second term was full of political strife. What did that do to the family? And and how involved were the now teenage grandchildren in the politics that were surrounding them? We, I think it's surprising because we tend to think, oh, George Washington was such a popular president. But if you look at his second term, it got very ugly. There was a pamphlet published that imagined guillotining him like the French king. So there's serious tensions in the country at this point. And he can't, as much as he would like to, be above those tensions. And just thinking about the fact that his office is in the house, it had to have permeated the atmosphere of the house. It had to have been stressful for them. And Nellie becomes certainly very politicized. She is a partisan for the Federalists, which while George Washington sort of identified himself as above party, he's certainly more identified with the Federalists by the second term. And she talks about herself as you know fiercely partisan, very anti-French, which is part of being Federalist at this point. We don't have writings from Wash, and he doesn't seem to have been part of these public events as much. And towards the end of the second term, he's sent away to college at Princeton, uh, which he later ends up having to leave for some kind of disciplinary infractions, including sowing disrespect for teachers, apparently. But he doesn't seem to be as tied into this. It seems like it would have weighed much more on Nellie and Martha. You said that George and Martha were very interested in the people that the grandchildren would choose as their spouses. And certainly at this time period, it was really an important choice for women uh, in terms of their own uh, uh, economic situations. So can we just quickly uh, talk about who Patty, who Betsy and Nellie married? Right. The choice of spouse is quite important. And the parents aren't making the choice for the daughters at this point, but it is supposed to be with their approval. So the first one to marry is actually Patty, and she's marrying a man named Thomas Peter, whose family is a wealthy family in Georgetown, which is right next. It actually at the time was seen as a different city from Washington City. So the District of Columbia would come to include Georgetown, Alexandria and Washington City. So he's from this sort of old money family in Georgetown that also owns some plantations. Uh, farther out in Maryland. And that seems to be a very happy marriage. They are getting married fairly young, have a large family of children, and seem to be very happy together 
The next to get married is Betsy, or as she starts calling herself after she gets married, Eliza, just to make the names more complicated that her nickname changes. She seems to be courting this man named Thomas Law secretly. Nobody in the family knows about it, and they are shocked when she announces the engagement. And in fact, she writes George Washington for courtship advice at the point that she knew she was about to get engaged. And a lot of the advice he gives basically describes a man nothing like Thomas Law. Things like, don't marry somebody who's a lot older than you. Well, Thomas Law was 20 years older. Thomas Law had been a uh, government agent in India for the British government. He had several children by an Indian woman who we don't really know a lot about or what that relationship was, but he brought those mixed race children to the United States with him. Washington is also saying, you know, you want to make sure that you're marrying somebody where you have congenial tempers. And what we find out is that both Thomas and Eliza are very strong willed, sort of erratic people who can't get along. But they do marry. George Washington says, you know, I'm really surprised by this engagement, but if this is the guy you want to marry, that's okay. He also, Thomas did have to go to Eliza's stepfather, David Stewart, and sort of prove his financials that he could financially support her. And then Nellie is the last of the girls to marry, the one who said she was determined to be a spinster. She's saying this even right before the guy she's going to marry shows up at Mount Vernon. This is a nephew of George Washington's named Lawrence Lewis, his sister Betty's son, who apparently looked a lot like George Washington, Multiple people said that. So that's kind of an interesting note there. He was pursuing Nellie. She initially wasn't interested. And then there's a chance that there's going to be a war with France. And Lawrence gets a military appointment. And when Nellie realizes that he might leave, then suddenly she's like, oh, yes, I would like to marry you. So George Washington is delighted by this and promises to give them a piece of land out of his Mount Vernon estate where they can build a house. And he's just delighted to have Nellie sort of staying within the family circle here. And he says, you know, because she is marrying into my family. So even still recognizing her as as the adopted daughter um, and Lawrence as his blood relative, that this is strengthening the tie he has with her at this point. After their marriages, you write that they were these grandchildren, the women, were positioned to become leading figures in the fledgling D.C. society. So was there celebrity about politics, about money, or about power? That's an interesting question. I think it differs a little bit for each of them. I don't know that I would necessarily say it's money in terms of cash. These people are rich in land and in enslaved people. The daughters all inherit around 60 enslaved people as part of their dowry, and then they get another 40 or so after Martha dies from Mount Vernon. So that is where their wealth is. So they they are wealthy in that sense. They are cash poor most of their lives. I think in Eliza's case, there is much more of the political power here. She's the only one that is living in Washington City on Capitol Hill with her husband, and they know everybody. And she has congressmen stopping by her house all the time. She knows everything that's going on in the city. And so I think that there is a political power there for Eliza. And she's certainly building that on, I'm George Washington's. She often said, his best love child. That's how she described herself. So she believes she gets this power from her family connection. Nellie and Patty are a little bit farther out from the city and don't have quite the same level of political influence, although that sort of varies over time. But it is really their family name that gives them power. It doesn't necessarily make them money. It doesn't mean, of course, because they're women that they're going to be elected to office. Uh, And in the case of their brother, he can't be elected to office because he lives in Arlington, which was then part of the District of Columbia. And so there's no federal office he can run for. So, you know, if he lived somewhere else, might that have been different? Possibly. But really, their power comes from who they are more than anything else. 
So let's fast forward a little bit. After uh, George died in 1799, Martha followed him in death in 1802. Uh, you write about, uh, well, first of all, you mentioned that Bushrod Washington, the nephew, inherited Mar- Mount Vernon itself. Uh, but the uh, family staged an auction of their grandparents' belongings, the interior furnishings and uh, and paintings and all that sort of thing after Martha Washington died. But the family scooped it all up. And it's interesting because these items seem to become a real key to their ongoing celebrity. How so? I think you're absolutely right there. So this auction is part of Martha's will that she has inherited everything in the house after George Washington died. And then she wants to raise money for her nephew's education. So they're going to have this auction. They announce it publicly. But by the time the public gets there, the Custis grandkids have bought all of the good stuff. They are furnishing their own houses, but it does seem clear that they realize there's going to be power in having these objects. These objects are treated kind of like relics. They are sort of civic relics. And to be able to touch something that George Washington touched, you see people writing about experiencing, encountering these relics as a sort of way to encounter George Washington. And certainly the grandkids use them that way. And Wash Custis goes into quite a bit of debt buying objects for what he calls his Washington treasury. So in the 19th century, if you wanted to see objects from Mount Vernon, you didn't go to Mount Vernon. You went to Arlington House, Wash Custis's house, because that's where the largest number of them were. And he welcomed people to come in and tell them stories. But the other siblings have quite a few objects as well, and they're using them in their daily lives. There's even um, the example of Patty Peter and her husband got George Washington's bedpan at the auction. And this was something that women would use when they were in their lying in period, basically staying in bed after having a child. And she probably used it for that purpose. She was having kids at that point. But it does go along with the other family relics. The Peters actually attached little stickers with numbers and cataloged the hundreds of Washington relics they had, and the bedpan was among them. So it was everything from you know, fine porcelain to mundane things like a bedpan. It's really interesting as the story unfolds over time, they were giving significant uh, items away to curry yeah. political favor. But uh, what what struck me was that they got to the point, and this might have been Wash, where they, he was cutting individual words out of George Washington's ledgers. So you might get one word written by Washington and using that as a token to give uh, to curry favor with, with people. Or the one of the daughters was cutting cutting up George Washington's breeches uh, to yes. send away small fa- pieces of fabric. So, it, it, And these totems really mattered, I guess, to the people that were getting them. Right. And people often say to me, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. They were cutting letters. They were cutting pieces of clothing. And yes, from a modern perspective, that's horrifying. And we would never do that. But at the time, they didn't think about historical objects in the same way. It was sort of a, scholars talk about an association value. It was, you know, through the physicality of this object, I can access that famous person. So it didn't matter if it was a scrap of the pants or the full pair of pants, or a scrap of the letter or the full letter. And so we see that actually both Wash and Eliza are cutting up. I mean, some of the letters where Eliza sends a scrap of pants, she also sends a scrap from a letter from George Washington. And you know, we actually know which pair of pants she was doing this from because she didn't cut the whole thing up. And Mount Vernon has this pair of black velvet breeches that match the little patches with a big raggedy hole in them from where she cut out the bits. And she's sending them to all sorts of people. It's also a way she'll say, not just remember George Washington, remember me, often saying, remember me, who was his best loved child. So it's also self-promotion for all of them, I think, when they're giving these gifts. Wash Custis uh, inherited 18,000 acres of land, including what we now know as Arlington Cemetery. Let's um, have you talk a little bit about the woman he married, Molly Fitzhugh, because she does have, as according to your writing, some influence on him. I think she has a lot of influence, although there's limit to it, which I'll get to. But when they meet, they probably meet as children. They, They are distant cousins, they've known each other for years. And this seems to be a very happy marriage. 
although they have four children in fairly quick succession and only one of them survives. And that's a daughter, Mary Anna Randolph Custis. And Molly, from early on, it's clear is uncomfortable with slavery. She comes from a slaveholding family. But as soon as there is this movement called the American Colonization Movement and the formation of a society that aims to send free black people to a colony in Africa that will become Liberia, she becomes one of the earliest people involved in that movement. She joins it far earlier than her husband, who does later, several years later, become involved. And while abolitionists, white abolitionists later, and certainly black abolitionists from the beginning, looked at this as a fairly racist movement, to her, this was the benevolent thing to do and the way to solve the problem of slavery. And it seems clear that she wanted Wash to free their enslaved people. And there's a point at which he says he has a plan to do it. And he says this in a public newspaper piece, but it doesn't happen. He does not free all of the people that he owns until in his will at his death, they are going to be freed. I think also in addition to the slavery issue, Molly is a deeply religious woman. She's an evangelical Christian. She desperately wants her husband to share those beliefs. It doesn't appear that he quite gets there pretty much until his deathbed, but she does seem to be sort of pushing that influence with him as well. So as adults, the first big political event was the upcoming War of 1812. And you describe it as a time of great political passions in the country. <clears throat> and uh, however, for the Custis family, this war was personal and that they seized the opportunity as heirs to George Washington to get involved in the national dialogue over the war. Can you tell me more about that? The War of 1812 is one of these very little known wars because it's, in terms of total number of people involved, not that big. And the treaty that ends the war says things will go to st status quo antebellum, the way they were before the war. So as a practical matter, it doesn't have a huge effect. But there's several big things that come out of this war. One is the partisan differences. The Federalists, who are mostly located in New England and are more pro-England against France, do not want to go to war with England, partially because it's going to hurt merchant interests in New England. And there is bitter partisan fighting. Some of the states in the North refuse to supply soldiers for the war. There's attacks on presses of various political parties. The Democratic Republicans are the ones more in support of the war. And Eliza is the only sibling who's a Democratic Republican at this point. Patty will always be a Federalist, even though the Federalist Party basically dies out at the end of the War of 1812. She, to her death, her granddaughter, her daughter described her as a Federalist. And so the siblings are disagreeing over this, too. The other thing that brings George Washington into it is that the British attack Washington, D.C., and they burn down the president's house. They burn all the federal buildings. And this is George Washington's namesake city. So in some ways, that's a personal affront to them. And Wash Custis, even though he's been a Federalist, he is willing to go fight. He goes out to Bladensburg, where they're trying to stop the British from getting to Washington, and supposedly mans a cannon there uh, to help in the fight. Whereas his sister, Patty, she can see the city burning from her house in Georgetown at Tudor Place. She can sort of see the fires in the city. She goes down a few days later with her husband. She meets some of the soldiers. And interestingly, this is sort of a spinoff of the Napoleonic Wars. And it is Wellington's troops who've come from the Peninsular Wars to burn Washington. And Patty Peter talks about what gentlemen they all are. And when she has a baby, not that long afterwards, so she's pregnant at the time this happens, she names that child Britannia Wellington. And that's just sort of a startling show of how much she loves the British who have just burned down the city named after her step-grandfather, who she adored. And so the siblings have very different reactions to how this war plays out. Moving ahead about a dozen years to the next big event that the Custis family got involved in, and that's the tour of the Marquis de Lafayette. 
the hero of the Revolutionary War who made this triumphal, was it almost a year-long tour of the United States, yeah. uh, 1824, 1825. And um, you say it's hard to overstate the euphoria and fanfare greeting Lafayette at every stop on his tour. Fifty years after the Revolutionary War, why was there such a big reception for Lafayette? What were people craving? There's a few things here. Interestingly, they hadn't been talking about the revolution that much. It was fairly recent. They hadn't built up nostalgia for it yet. But Lafayette had been so young during the time of the war that he is one of the last surviving important officers from the war, uh, if not the most important surviving officer. And he had been beloved during the war. But so when he comes back and is going to visit he goes to every state in the country at this point, everybody sort of sees him as a reminder of the greatness of the American Revolution and the greatness of America as a country. And there is this warm relationship with France at this point, too. So he represents those ties with France. He's just an immensely popular figure. The souvenirs that are created at the time, there's things like kid gloves for women that have his face on them. There's pottery, there's fabrics, there's prints you could buy, everything you can imagine. And everywhere he goes, there's thousands of people turning out to see him. And so it is a monumental event. The Custises already knew him. They were young children when he had been in the revolution. So they'd kept in touch with him, but they hadn't seen him for a long time. They talk about him as a sort of adopted father figure. And they are very close with him. And so they are certainly a big part of his tour, especially when he's in the D.C. area and he visits all of the siblings. And they certainly make sure all of those stories get into the newspapers. The uh, visit of Lafayette, you said that it presented them an opportunity again and again to reinforce their own celebrity, making sure that every stop they went to was in the newspaper. But you also write that it, it instilled in Wash Custis a new passion and new purpose. What were those passions and purpose that he found through Lafayette? So he starts talking to Lafayette about, about memories of the revolution. And he's initially going to write up for the newspaper, some kind of reminiscences specifically of Lafayette. But then he just starts writing up stories he has heard from George Washington and Washington's friends about the revolution itself. And this starts a process he's going to keep writing columns for the newspaper the rest of his life, which will be turned into a book of his recollections after his death. Not only is he writing these newspaper columns, he just gets obsessed with memorializing the revolution in general, which many Americans do in the wake of Lafayette's visit. So he writes historical plays, some about the revolution. He also does these massive historical paintings of George Washington during various important battles. If you look these paintings up online, they are not particularly skillful, but uh, he spent a lot of time on them. The other thing that comes out of that visit with Lafayette is their discussions about slavery. Lafayette had pressed George Washington on this issue. Lafayette is very anti-slavery and He, in fact, is trying out a solution of setting up an island in the Caribbean where freed, formerly enslaved people can go. And he clearly talks to Wash about this. And it is in the wake of Lafayette's visit that Wash publishes something saying, you know, I have this plan to free my enslaved people over the course of the next 10 to 15 years. I think that would not have happened if it hadn't been for Lafayette's visit. Unfortunately, that energy around anti-slavery sort of dissipates over time for Wash. Well, on the flip side of that, he had a pretty sordid history, a pretty sordid record of sexual abuse of the of some of the women he enslaved. What was that history? It seems to go back pretty far in his life. And in fact, his father may have also uh, had a child by an enslaved woman through sexual exploitation. Um, so a half-sibling of the Custises. So this was not unusual in Wash's family or in the life of enslavers. Um, There was no idea about consent at this point when enslaved people are property. And so we have a few people that we can pinpoint through family stories, particularly Mariah Syfax, this young woman who's born around 1803 or four. So this is around the time that Wash is getting married to Molly Custis. And Mariah Syfax 
is actually the one child that he gives 17 acres of land to, as well as freeing her. But there's a number of other children, around 10 of them, and their mothers that he frees. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that those were probably all his children, because after his death, there were numerous newspaper articles, one of, uh, about the fact that he had children by enslaved women, one of which said he had about a dozen, so that would be close to that 10. Uh, another that had a much higher number, which maybe included grandchildren or great-grandchildren by those people. These are never people that he publicly recognizes as his family, although that gift of land is as close as he got. But everybody in the area knew, and his whole family, including his wife, had to know. And I do wonder how much of her opposition to slavery came out of the fact that she is experiencing her husband sexually exploiting women on their plantation. One of the uh, people who's a legacy of this practice from his father, Jackie, is a, a man by the name of, of uh, William Coston. Is that right? Right. William Coston. William Coston. And you've just published a, an excerpt of this as a magazine piece that I just read. But he, he went on to quite a prestigious career as a free man in Washington, D.C., and had a long relationship with the family. Uh, the, the ties between them are interesting, given his family a, a legacy with them. Right. William Costin is such an interesting story because we're still piecing together things. I keep hoping that more pieces are going to turn up or that a descendant will come forward because in the case of somebody like Mariah Syfax, we do have current day descendants who have family stories about this, family knowledge objects that have been passed down. In the case of William Costin, his mother was a na- woman named Anne or Nancy um, who had apparently had children first with a man by the last name Costin and then somebody by the last name Holmes. But Costin was not William Costin's father. There's pretty good evidence that it was Jackie. Now, William Costin marries an enslaved woman named Delphi Judge, the sister of Ona Judge, who was in Erica Dunbar's book, Never Caught, who is able to find freedom um, in New Hampshire uh, and escape from the Washingtons. And both William, his wife, his half-siblings, his mother, and then all of his children are freed by the Custises, specifically by Eliza and her husband. And he gives all of his children the middle name Park, which is a Custis family tradition, going back to a strange lawsuit. But they all use this middle name Park. And it's hard to imagine why he would have done that. And one of them, in fact, is Park Custis is the middle name. Why would he do that if he didn't think he was related to them? He also keeps up relationships with them. He even lends them money at one point. Eliza deposits a copy of her will with him. This is a very trusted person in their lives. And he also builds a life for himself in the nation's capital. He owns property on Capitol Hill. He becomes a porter for the Bank of Washington and is very respected. He also, when there's a new law passed in D.C. saying that free black people have to register with the government and put up a bond for good behavior, basically that they would forfeit if they did something wrong, he refuses to do this and takes the law to court. And in the court case, the argument his lawyer makes, which I believe must have been in consultation with Costin, is, you know, people should be treated equally. All people should have this, all men basically should have this right to vote. And the judge sort of dismisses that and says, no, come on. Like, no, people can be restricted from voting, but you can't apply this law retroactively. So Costin does win this, basically what I would call civil rights case, but not on the larger principle he's putting forward, which is pretty progressive for the time. And he stays a prominent citizen in DC. He's involved in a lot of black charitable organizations. And when he dies, it appears that all of the prominent white people and black people come to his funeral. And John Quincy Adams uses him as an example in a speech in Congress on, you know, black people should also have the right to vote. You just went to this guy's funeral because you respected him so much and he was black. And why wouldn't you want him to vote? So he is sort of this model in the city Uh, in ways, you know, I think his character was respected in ways that I don't think the Custises ever were. 
And, and you also noted that he did more to advance the nation's ideals than the Custis grandchildren did as well. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in our conversation, uh, and there's still lots more we could talk about. But one thing I do want to, to get on the record is that uh, the support that Wash, Nellie, and Eliza gave to Andrew Jackson, seeing the, him as their grandfather's political heir. Now, George Washington's Federalist politics or views and Andrew Jackson's populism seem very far afield. So what was the basis for their support? It is very strange because certainly based on their political views, Eliza, maybe as a Democratic Republican, that might make sense. Um, But for the others, absolutely not. This is not the kind of person that their partisan views would align with. But there's a couple of factors here. One is he is the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. They had met him after that. They love military heroes. George Washington was a military hero. And so it's partially that. Also, one of the young men that he served as a sort of surrogate father for, Edward George Washington Butler, married Nellie's daughter. And so they also had that personal family connection with him. But it clearly by this point for them is not about specific partisan beliefs. And if you look at their politics for the rest of their adult lives in terms of which candidates they're supporting, it's it's not about partisanship. They later support Zachary Taylor, who has basically no partisan or no specific views on much of anything, which is why the Whigs run him. But he he's a Whig. They now have flipped to supporting the opposite party with Zachary Taylor, but he is a famous military general. And so I think more than anything, it was that identification of a famous general that attracted them. You carry the story through to the next generation, the children of Wash, Nellie, and Eliza, and how they uh, continued the plantation lifestyle and and were slaveholders as well. I, I wanted to talk about just one of them, because one of them had a very famous spouse, and that is Wash, Wash's only child marries a Virginia military person. Who was he? Right, so Wash's only white daughter, Mary, marries a, another distant cousin, Robert E. Lee, who she had known from childhood. Uh, interestingly, her father is not thrilled about this marriage. Robert E. Lee's family did not have a great reputation. His father had uh, died in debt, basically. His stepbrother had been involved in a scandal. Um, and also Wash knew that Robert E. Lee was going into the military. He went to West Point. And so that meant he was going to have sort of peripatetic lifestyle. And Wash wasn't sure that's what he wanted for his daughter. But Mary fell in love. Robert E. Lee actually had plenty of women who would have been interested in him. He was a handsome, flirtatious, charming young man. But he obviously also was in love with Mary already knew her parents and was close with them. And so they get married in 1831. And they never really have a permanent house of their own. Arlington House is their home base. And that is the house that Wash Custis has had built. And it is the house that his daughter, Mary Custis Lee, will inherit. And it's worth noting that Robert E. Lee never owns this house. It is George Washington, Mark Custis, and then Mary Custis Lee. And that is actually an issue right now because the National Park Service site, Arlington House, is named Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial. And there's a campaign to get that Lee name removed off of there, which you know, is partially about the role in the Civil War, but also it was not his house. <laughs> Yeah, and we, uh, who are locals, always call it the Lee Custis Mansion, recognizing right. both of the families that are in it. Uh, so with the short time we have left, uh, the Wash was the longest surviving. And uh, you say that when he died, uh, he had an enormous funeral, huge obituary. But there the story ends for the Custises, and that their the notoriety does not continue to the next generation. And you put the blame squarely at the feet of Robert E. Lee. Why? Robert E. Lee, because of marrying into this family, was seen in many ways as the heir of George Washington. And, you know, there have actually been several books to that effect. And so when Robert E. Lee decides to take up arms against the union that George Washington helped found, Northerners especially see this as a profound betrayal and see the whole family as sort of dragged down by that. And that's 
partially fair because many of the other descendants in the family did fight for the Confederacy. There were some that fought for the United States, but the majority fought for the Confederacy. And of course, Robert E. Lee is quite famous. And in the aftermath of the Civil War, with the Reconstruction government, you know, there's not a lot of uh, love lost for Lee. They even, you know, are bringing him up again afterwards. And the sentiment is very much against him. And so I do think because of his association with the family and because the country, at least as sort of directed culturally by Northerners, sees him as a traitor, they are no longer as interested in this family. And interestingly, Southerners who are revering Robert E. Lee are not that focused on his Washington connection. They do talk about this, but certainly afterwards, the focus is on Lee himself and the Lee family and to the extent that I'm sure that there were plenty of people in the South that did not remember soon after the Civil War that Robert E. Lee was related to Washington. And so I, I do think that his decision, unlike the decision of most of the Southern officers who went to West Point to join the Confederacy, is part of what sort of sinks the family and the nation's esteem. So, Cassandra Good, we have a couple minutes left, and you had some closing thoughts in the book to share with your readers, and I want you to say a couple more words. Uh, the Custis's story is worth knowing and remembering. Few Americans know about the family he raised, and from them we can see how a family can be built from conscious choice, not just from DNA. What are you saying there? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that the Custis's are not related to George Washington by blood. If you did a DNA test, they're not related. Um, And yet they are the people known to the public, both during George Washington's lifetime as president and then long afterwards as his family. And I think it's important to keep in mind that in many cases, who we define as family is a choice, who we leave out of our family or who we include in it. There's conscious choices there. They are leaving out people like William Costin or Mariah Syfax in their construction of Washington's family and who is Washington's heirs. And I think that people right now, because of the prominence of DNA tests, have gotten really hooked into this idea of biological family when the norm in many ways in our society is families with lots of different configurations that are built by choices that we make. You also tell readers that doing your work on the the family of George Washington got you interested in finding out more about your own genealogy. So have you found any interesting uh, uh, antecedents along the way here that you hadn't known about before? Nobody famous, although I was, and I have not done DNA myself. My aunt has done it, and actually while I was working on this, a cousin of my father's found out through DNA that the man who raised him as his father is not his father. So that sort of also brought up these questions for me about how much of a role does DNA play versus the people who actually raise us. And there have been a lot of these stories, right, that you know DNA is revealing all sorts of secrets. Uh, but no famous antecedents, but I was able to trace my family back through my grandfather's line to the about 1780s uh, in France. And as far as we knew, he had always said he basically didn't have any family. I discovered he had a massive family and then it was his branch of the family I could trace back the farthest. So that was probably the biggest surprise. And one minute we have left. You also note in your acknowledgments that you had a chance to work with some of George Washington's descendants. What is it like for people today? Is there still a connection that these current people make with George Washington in their own lives? It depends on the person. So there is a group of George Washington descendants, some of whom are really sort of lateral descendants of, you know, his grandfather's line. So it's fairly far out. And so those people are actively identifying as George Washington's family. There's um, also Custis groups that get together, especially, you know, with the historic sites that they're associated with, that I think their association is more through the Custis family than necessarily to George Washington himself. And then there's the black descendants, some of whom really don't want to talk about this because of the pain of the fact that they know that their ancestry comes through sexual exploitation. Others of them feel that it's important to tell the story and they want to talk about it. And it it really varies by the person. 
Um, there's been some great work going on at Arlington House. Uh, there was recently a reunion of black and white descendants um, of people that lived at Arlington House that came together and are working together to sort of help do new interpretation at the site. And I think that's a really exciting step moving forward. The book is called First Family, Washington's Heirs and the Making of America. Cassandra Good is its author, historian. And we thank you very much for spending a whole hour with us and telling us more about the lives of George Washington's step-grandchildren. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Remember, if you subscribe to this podcast, you'll never miss an episode. And I'd really like to hear from you about our interviews. You can email me at podcasts, that's podcast with an S, at c-span.org. Your feedback is welcome. 